I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 77 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 077. We have a carry tip for this episode, and that is carry quality and plan for failure. Always carry a quality firearm in a quality holster on a quality belt if applicable. Now, quality means fail less, not fail proof. Since firearms are machines and because machines fail, we need to plan for failure as well as plan around it. And some of you may be wondering where this is going. Basically, you don't want to go out there and carry a high point in an Uncle Mike's holster that's made out of nylon on a cheap, $5 $5 Walmart or Dollar General store belt. I'm sorry, but all three of those are uh, failure prone. Why? Because they're not quality. Now, some folks will say, well, you need to carry a Glock because that's the only thing that's good. Or others might say, well, you only need to carry a 1911 because that's the only firearm that John Moses Browning designed that I approve of. Or, or maybe they're going to be a SIG fanatic or maybe they're going to be a Ruger fanatic or a Smith & Wesson fanatic, it doesn't matter. Carry a quality firearm. Now, that does not mean go out and buy a $3,000 less bear or, you know, similar 1911 to carry. In a lot of cases, the high-end competition-grade guns are not ideal carry guns, and that's because they're set up for a game. And to me, A lot of those fancy bells and whistles like extended safeties and extended mag releases and extended this and extended that, they get in the way. But that's enough preaching on my opinion of extended features. Go out, you get yourself a quality firearm, and then you go and you get yourself a quality uh, holster. Let's say you go and get yourself a Republic Forge 1911. Those are expensive, yes, but I... I have it on good authority that they're a high-quality gun. I have yet to get one in my hands, but they're a Texas company, so let's refer to them as, or an STI. They're a Texas company, too. So here you are with a Republic Forge or an STI 1911. Now, they're both quality guns. They're both made in Texas. You need a holster to go with it. Well, you decide to stick with the Texas company. So you call up CompTAC and tell them you want a quality holster. Comtac obliges you and sends you a holster. Well, you need a belt. Before you hang up with Comtac, maybe you order one of their belts. In fact, I'm wearing a Comtac belt now. Now, I'm not endorsing these companies. I'm just using them because they're Texas companies. I'm, that's why I'm referring to them. I mentioned that I'm wearing the Comtac belt because I am. No, I did not get any kind of sponsorship or anything like that. I bought this with my own hard-earned money. In fact, I don't even know if anybody at Comtac listens to this podcast. But that's beside the point. The point of it is, you can you can buy quality products and you can get them from a Texas manufacturer. Now, when you buy a firearm that's a quality gun, and you buy it from a Texas manufacturer because, well, you want to support your uh, your state's businesses, you also gain something else. You gain that near local feel when something goes wrong. You can call them up, and they don't talk with a funny New York style accent or maybe a California Valley Girl accent, they talk with a Texas accent, and you can understand what they're saying, and you're dealing with a person that they know your environment better than somebody in Nome, Alaska does, and when you're dealing with these Texas companies, they take, they really do, they take pride in making sure that the people close to home feel like they're wanted. After all, Tejas means friendly, but like I said, you plan around failure. So you buy the quality equipment to make it um, less likely to fail. But then you throw in a backup gun. With open carry becoming law in just a few weeks, guess what? Carry your primary openly and your backup concealed. Maybe you'll carry them both openly. Maybe you'll carry them both concealed. That's up to you. When I go to New Mexico, I carry one gun openly and I carry one gun concealed. Why? Because New Mexico is a one-gun a concealed carry state. It's a stupid law, but actually it's not even a law. It's a regulation, I believe. And in Texas, we don't have uh, that, uh, well, we don't have that bad idea. But you plan around that failure. The most likely thing to fail on semi-autos, the magazine. So you carry an extra magazine fully loaded. This means that if you get into a firefight and your magazine doesn't fail, 
you have at least one extra magazine to fight your way out of it with. If your magazine does fail, that means you're not out of the fight. You still have one magazine that hopefully will work. If that fails, well, you got a backup gun. Maybe you got an extra magazine for it too. I recommend it. But with that said, we need to move on. We need to move on and we need to cover something that's even more important. We need to cover the topic. And we need to cover something more important than the topic. We need to cover the listener feedback. So I'm going to hit the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And then we're going to come back. I'm going to give you some listener feedback and we'll go from there. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, we have a listener that wrote in wanting to know why our news girl does not want her real name being used. Well, you would have to ask her that and... Since I forwarded the email to her and I haven't got a response on it, I'm going to assume that she doesn't want to share that. We have another listener who thinks the idea of a random name for our news girl is kind of funny. Well, I do too. So we're going to call her Ashley today. And I, anything that the audience sends me about our news girl, I, uh, I forward it to her. It's kind of a riot. She's just somebody that wants to volunteer. They call some news items out of uh, some Google feeds and out of local media sources. She's uh, She was living in the Lubbock area. She just moved out of that area. She's still, she's still within an hour and a half drive of where I'm at, but she's still in Texas. Don't worry. And she's still contributing. In fact, I'm, I probably may, I'll probably make her mad with this episode because... She had something like, oh, I want to say eight or nine news items. And I pulled, I pulled a number of them out to, to kind of use them as our topic. This topic's kind of a loose ends type deal. However, moving on, we had a number of listeners email us about some kind of feud developing between CJ Grisham and Open Carry Texas. Uh, well, not between them, but between... C.J. Grisham slash Open Carry Texas and Alice Tripp of the TSRA. Now, I'm not entirely sure what this is about. I didn't get specifics, but according to one of the emails, this happened on Twitter. I've been, I've been away from the computer and telephone and anything that, any electronic device that emits light. I've been trying to avoid looking at them for the last few days. There's a reason behind that, and I won't go into details. Because that's a little bit of a humiliating story. And it's not really related to the podcast other than it had an effect on my preparation of it. We had listeners email us about maybe doing a special episode after the first. Maybe just covering a bunch of news items that pop up about open carry in the news. I don't think there's going to be that much news about it unless... Open Carry Texas, Come and Take It, uh, Open Carry Tarrant County, and all these other groups go out and they make a scene. If they do, then there'll probably be a lot of news articles and news stories. If they don't, it'll be a non-event just like every other gun law. And that's really what I'm looking forward to is a non-event. Why? Because it's a non-event everywhere else in the country where open carry is legal. We don't want it to be an event here because that means something's wrong. Okay, moving on. Doesn't want us uh, reading his email online. This one kind of covers a subject that I'm not ready to cover yet. And here's one I want to talk about. Let's see. That's the same. Basically, it's the same one. Okay. We ha- looks like we got about three emails on this subject. We we had people emailing us about uh, the no fly, no buy push. Uh, that's what I want to call it. You know what, I'm going to actually cover that in the topic. I'm going to add that to the end of the show notes. And then they're wanting, and then we have another one that's kind of tied into those because they're they're basically wanting to know why the San Bernardino attack is, why anti seem to be so convinced that the San Bernardino attack can be used to strip gun rights. 
And then they go on to list the no-fly, no-buy push being part of that effort. Okay, we're not touching that one yet. We've covered that one. How did that one get in here? Looks like my email uh, has a duplicate because I have the exact same one with the exact same date in my covered folder. Hmm, that's weird. Okay, we got one more email I'm going to touch on before I wrap this up. Now, this comes in. It says uh, he, he's asking that we don't identify his name, but he's asking us to cover reloading. And I plan to do another reloading episode sometime. And you never can tell. I may just go out and find somebody that's an NRA certified reloading instructor because why not? And get them to come on. We can discuss reloading tips and tricks. There's maybe different press types that people might use for different applications. Or maybe we'll discuss why I have three reloading presses in front of me right now. And that'd be because I'm in my gun room and using it as my studio. Anyhow, that wraps it up for our uh, listener feedback. So I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. Then we'll come back and we'll hit our actual topic, which I kind of stole a bunch of it from our news girl who we're calling Ashley for this episode. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Okay, well, let's have a look at a few of the a few of the loose ends for 2015. I'm adding in one of the items, some of the stuff that people emailed us about, which is the OCT slash Grisham feuding with Alice Tripp on Twitter. Just looking over the emails, which is what I did while I was running that audio clip, it looks like this is uh, apparently CJ or Alice one made a comment about the other on Twitter that said basically the other or their group supported gun control or uh, attacked the other's rights or ta- attack gun owners' rights. During the legislative session, the other replied in kind. And here's the deal. One of the things is, Grisham accused Alice Tripp and the TSRA, along with the NRA, of killing constitutional carry and killing the... Uh, oh, man, I lost... I just closed my email client out. But anyways, it killed the amendment that... Uh, the Huffines Amendment, I believe it was. If I got the name wrong, somebody will correct me on the next episode. But the Huffines Amendment... The NRA and TSRA was accused of killing, and I'm going to address CJ with this one. With this one, if CJ Grisham really wants to see who killed the Huffines Amendment and unlicensed carry, my advice is that he walk into his bathroom, turn on his light, look above the sink into this glass object that's called a mirror. He'll probably find the responsible party staring right back at him, or at least one of the responsible parties. You'll also find uh, images of the responsible parties if he looks up Corey Watkins, as well as the leadership of Katie, and a bunch of his uh, and a bunch of his own little minions and cohorts in Open Carry Texas. Now, some people may say, "Well, that's wrong to say that." No, it's not. It's the truth. Unlicensed Carry was dead, and I'm going to run an audio clip that tells you why Unlicensed Carry was dead in this legislative session. This bill goes too far for some and not far enough for others. But I think it's a good start. Oops, that was the wrong one. Okay, I want to run the correct audio clip. This is what happens when I leave things on my soundboard and don't really play them very often. But this is the right one. Questions on the bill. Representative Phillips, I appreciate your efforts on this bill. You know that I am a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. You know that I have been working very hard and this is Stickling you hear talking right now. disagreed on the way to go about that. I was just curious on a personal level. I know that you have maintained that this bill was specifically about license holders. You know my argument is, is different and that we shouldn't have the license to begin with. Will you honestly work with me? Will you, will you give my bill a hearing in your committee so that we can have and that discussion? And more whining from Stickland. You know that I am going to support your bill today because it's an advancement of Second Amendment rights. But there are literally tens of thousands of people uh, who Mr. believe Mr. we Mr. need Stick- to go to more. Will you work with me, Representative Phillips? Let me answer that. Mr. Stickland, uh, 
This is where it gets good. This is uh, Representative the Phillips. The date of your bill was cast when the Senate decided they were not going to take up constitutional carry. I'm not going to argue with you. Your fate was treated as how you treated members on this floor as it related to your legislation and other legislation. It's also how those that Do you support hear that your amendment have treated members of this House, their families, and our staff that there is no reason when there's other members who've worked hard, who try to work with each other, they have to have a chance to have, to have their hearing. They're going to get a hearing. Now, you also, uh, I'll run that. No, I won't run that again. Uh, you can find that clip on the show notes and in the, in the archives of the website, gunrightsintexas.com. But he's also talking about his supporters uh, or Stickland supporters and their actions killed it. I kind of covered that up with my... Uh, did you hear that applause? This is because these people made unlicensed or constitutional carry so unpalatable to the public because they were going out and acting like jackasses. Excuse the language, but they were. They were going out there and they were acting like jackasses in an effort to get attention and try to make open carry an issue. Well, guess what? They did. They made open carry an issue. And we had to fight. We had to fight off bad amendments. We had to fight off amendments that would have been good on the surface, except because of j these jackasses, the b governor himself telegraphed a veto on Twitter if one of these amendments were added in. And what amendment was that? Why, that was the Huffines Amendment. This is why the Huffines Amendment, and this is why unlicensed carry, a.k.a. constitutional carry, are dead. Now, I have had people ask me why I don't use the term constitutional carry to describe unlicensed carry, and there's a reason for that. Masad Ayub has an excellent article on why he recommends you don't call it constitutional carry, but I have a different reason. My reason is the right to carry arms, like the right to bear arms, or the right to keep arms, sorry, the right to keep and bear arms predates our Constitution. If you call it constitutional carry, you are implying that the Constitution gives you that right. If you imply that the Constitution gives you that right, then you also imply the Constitution can take that right away. And that's not correct. This is a right that, uh, it's a natural right. You don't believe me. Go to the zoo, break into a lion cage or into a bear cage, pick up a big rock, and hit the lion or the bear in the head with it. And see what happens. Why the lion or the bear is going to take those claws, or maybe those teeth, that it uses as arms, and it's going to bear them on you. This is a natural right. It exists in nature, and humans do not have teeth. They do not have, uh, not teeth like a, humans do have teeth, but not like a bear or a lion. Our teeth are more geared towards civilized use. We do not have claws, although I've dated a few girls that, when I was younger, that, well, they could be described as having them. However, you look at this natural right. If you imply the Constitution gives it to you by calling it constitutional carry, you are implying that the Constitution can be amended to take this right away from you. And the right to keep and bear arms as a natural right is a human right. And that's why I don't call it constitutional carry. I call it unlicensed carry. Not quite as catchy, but far more accurate and far less dangerous. And then there's Masada Ayub's uh, legal opinion on it. And he's somebody you don't quite dismiss on the issue. Although I really wouldn't, uh, I would seek out an attorney's advice before a firearms instructor on legal opinions. Although, if I had to seek out a firearms instructor for a legal opinion, Masada, you would be the one I would go to. Moving on, we have one more bit of news from Open Carry Texas. You see, it would seem Open Carry Texas was reportedly the victim of a false report being called into the police. I'll link to their video on YouTube in the show notes. Maybe I'll just throw the link in the show notes like it shows up in my outline. And this is one of the emails I stripped out of Ashley's email blast or news blast. Moving on to Open Carry news, the second Houston Open Carry meeting, which was between the public, the Houston PD, the Houston attorney, uh, county attorney's office and the Houston, or not Houston, but uh, uh, what's, is it Tarrant County that's in Houston? I believe it's the Tarrant County uh, attorney, the Tarrant County attorney's office. 
And then the Houston City Police or Houston City Attorney's Office. Good Lord. Anyways, they had another open carry meeting. They had one. It's up on YouTube. You can find it if you know how to navigate YouTube. And the second one is also up on YouTube, and I'll throw a link to it. There's some good information in it. There's a few little mistakes. Nothing like the one in Abilene, where there were some serious uh, mistakes made in that one. But Abilene also did their open carry meeting. I don't remember who all was involved in it. But there were issues on that one. And I'm of the opinion that um, I probably would be very nervous about open carrying in Abilene. Especially if I had a non-resident license from another state. Yeah, it was that bad. However, let's move on to campus carry. On campus carry, the University of Texas uh, campus carry panel has released their recommendations. And there's a lot of problems here. Hopefully these do not become the final hopefully these do not become the final draft. I'm sorry about that. I had to step away from the microphone for a second. However, if they do, this will give us a uh, momentum when we go before the legislature next year and or not next year in 2017. You see my brain's already operating in 2016. That's far how far ahead I have to plan the podcast. But in 2017 when we go back before the legislature, if they put these recommendations into their policy, It'll make it a lot easier to advance campus carry then. And if they don't, well, they make it, uh, they give us less of a need to advance campus carry. We have one more item, and this, this one, as well as uh, the campus carry panel releasing their recommendations, were news items that I took out of Ashley's thing as well. Uh, well, they come and take it, aka Katie, who is also known as don't comply. They try to be, uh, they try to present themselves as two different groups, but they're one and the same. They planned and performed a mock mass shooting near the University of Texas uh, campus. This would be their Austin campus. Now, there was a counter protest, which either they were making farting noises, they were actually farting, and I don't really want to go into there, and they were playing with sex toys as part of their protest. However, this counter-protest was, well, it wasn't amusing. It was kind of a, I don't know how you'd best describe it. It was a bunch of uneducated degenerates acting like they had an education. That's the only way to describe it. However, let's move on to the last thing I want to use as part of our topic. And we're going to go into the federal issues that people have been emailing me about. I normally don't touch on federal issues, but this time I feel a need to. There's been this huge no fly, then no buy push. If you're not, if you're on the no fly list, then they want you not to be able to buy a gun. There's a number of problems with this. First off, it's a secret list, and because it's a secret list, you do not get get any kind of notice that your rights are being infringed upon until you attempt to exercise them. So let's say you're an avid hunter, and you're you live in West Texas, but you're going to your deer lease in East Texas, and your hunting vehicle's broke into. Or maybe your uh, hunting vehicle is stolen, but you don't have any guns. So you go to the gun store, you're going to buy a new rifle, ammunition. You're not going to let this uh, burglary and theft ruin your hunting trip. So you go to the gun store, you make your decision, you fill out the 4473, you plunk, plunk down your money, you take a step back, and the FBI gets the phone call, and then they're told... Sorry, you can't sell a gun to this guy. They don't give them a reason. They never do. Gun stores will tell them, well, it's probably because your child support payments are out of kilter or something. Maybe you made, maybe you're paid ahead or you're behind on them. Or maybe it's, uh, maybe they got your name confused with somebody else. But the FBI does not tell them why. Now, the dealer gives you a card, you fill it out, or you follow the instructions on it, and you appeal. In the appeals process, you find out you're on the no-fly list. Why would you be on a no-fly list? You've never been to Turkey. You've never bought a one-way ticket out of country. You've never even talked about uh, anything terror-related. Why would you be on the no-fly list? You don't know, but it ruins your hunting trip. How do you get on the no-fly list? Well, nobody outside of the government that administers the secret process really knows. Maybe some bureaucrat somewhere sitting there and they're throwing darts at a board full of names and 
they throw a dart at the first name board. Maybe they throw one at the middle initial board. And then they throw one at the last name board. And they come up with John Q Public. So they plug John Q Public into the database. Maybe you cut them off in traffic, and rather than road rage on you, he jots down your license plate number, gets back to the office, looks up the owner of the vehicle, which is you, or maybe it's your friend, and he puts your friend on the no-fly list because he thinks you are your friend because you're driving your friend's vehicle after all. Or maybe there's somebody with the same name as you that got added. Maybe they got quotas and they just make up names to reach their quota. We don't know. It's a secret process. And unless you know you're on it, you can't, you can't request to be taken off. How do, you get, how do you get off the list? I don't know. But we do know there's no due process. So why would somebody lose their rights without having due process? Maybe we need to look at this in a different way. Maybe we should have it where you cannot go to certain churches because they have a history of violence in the name of their religion. These churches would be anything that, or not just churches, but any uh, religious assemblies. This would be anything Jewish, anything Christian, anything Islamic. Because each of these religions have had atrocities committed in their name. So if you go to a church and you're on the no-fly list, or you go to a synagogue, or you go to, I don't know what, I can't think of it right now, what an Islamic uh, religious building's called, a mosque. Or you go to a mosque and you're on the no-fly list, you'll be arrested and thrown in jail on terror charges. Well, that doesn't quite work out, does it? Okay, you can't buy a paper, a newspaper. You cannot access the internet without being on, or with if you're on the no-fly list. Well, that's a violation of the First Amendment. We can't have that. And there you go. The no-fly, no-buy push is a bad idea. There are people that address it far more eloquently than I do. But in the end, it all boils down to the same. There's no due process. It's unconstitutional. It's downright wrong. And it's insidious. You have a bureaucratic process just to add people to it. No due process. You don't know how they're added. So you could have a you could have a situation where if somebody goes in to office in the White House, they issue an executive order, IRS goes in, they they raid the NRA's office and they somehow get a list of NRA members, they could put every name on the NRA's membership roster into this no fly list. Bam. Gun sales drop dramatically in the time it takes to take this to court, get injunctions. A number of gun businesses go out of business. Or maybe they get the NAGR's mailing list. God knows they buy email addresses and sell email addresses all over the place. I once created an email address just for use with uh, NAGR to get on one of their mailing lists. It was less than two weeks after I used it for that, and only that, that it started getting filled up with spam. And it wasn't NAGR-related stuff. I deleted that email address. I don't even remember what email I used for that now, but that was a... That was an interesting experiment, by the way, and that was a few years ago. But that's the danger of a bureaucratic process being used to strip somebody of their rights rather than due process. Imagine if they stripped you of your Fourth and Fifth Amendments. You have, If you're on the terror watch list or the no-fly list, then you cannot refuse to incriminate yourself. Or you have no protection from unreasonable and unwarranted searches and seizures. That would suck. Excuse the language, but it would. I think I want to throw the explicit tag on iTunes for this one. But hey, I got one last thing I want to touch on, and I want to get off the no fly, no buy push. Let's look at three different terror attacks. Two are here in the U.S., one is in France. We could go for two in France if you want, but we're just going to do one. The first one, we had two uh, Durka Durka douchebags drive into Texas from one of the lesser states to the west with this intention to kill people at a Jaw Muhammad cartoon contest. They show up in Garland, Texas. They don't even find a place to park before the security is uh, putting an end to their little wannabe rampage. They manage to discharge a few rounds, strike a security guard in the ankle, and get killed. Three Texans with one injury among them versus two terrorists with two deaths among them. ISIS, zero. Texas, one. Let's move on to Paris, France. You know, Paris has had a couple of Islamic-related terror attacks, but we're going to talk about the most recent. 
that I'm aware of. Terrorists show up, they run amok, they kill a bunch of people. Finally, finally, people show up with guns and engage them. Now, do some of the terrorists escape? I don't remember. Do they all die? I doubt it. But France turns around and starts bombing ISIS targets. However, France is gun-free for the most part. People with guns do not uh, carry them anywhere in France unless they're military or police. And then let's go to San Bernardino, California. Now, my understanding is the San Bernardino shooting happened at a federal facility, or at least a facility leased by the federal government. Might have been a state government agency, but guns were banned. Terrorists show up. They're wearing body armor, apparently. They got modified ARs. They got handguns. They go on a rampage. 23 officers end up being used to take them out. But the officers had to get there. Berlin, Texas, you had you had armed individuals. They were, my understanding was, one was an armed security guard, two were off-duty police officers doing security work. They might have all three been police officers, and they may have been all three on duty. But they were there, they had guns, they engaged the threat, and they stopped it before anybody outside of themselves were injured. Paris, France, guns are outlawed. Paris, get guns. Paris, go on shooting spree until armed forces respond to them. San Bernardino, California. Terrorists attack a gun-free zone. Terrorists get shot after armed forces respond to the shooting. Now, when you're dealing with somebody that's wearing body armor, it becomes far more difficult to stop them. However, if you know what you're doing and you're a good enough shot and you can, you can stop somebody wearing body armor if you know how to do it. You just have to understand how the body armor works and you have to understand you have to understand how to use that to your advantage. Now typically when a shooter gets shot at, they they do not stick around. They move on. Why? Because their objective is to create carnage and chaos. If they get into a drawn out gun battle with somebody, that limits the carnage and chaos that they're going to be able to cause. So either they move on or they retreat. Now, the San Bernardino shooters apparently planned to move on and do more damage after they got done with what they were doing. But it was an armed response that put an end to their attack. It wasn't uh, people holding arms and singing Kumbaya. It wasn't people uh, walking up and giving them daisies. It wasn't people driving hybrid vehicles or uh, smart cars or all this other hippie BS. No, it was people with guns. Yeah, they were law enforcement. And we're hearing this narrative. We're hearing this narrative that people with guns do not stop mass shootings. And for the most part, that's true. You don't hear about people with guns stopping mass shootings very often. There's a handful of them, but it's a very small percentage of the mass shootings that they represent. And there's two reasons. The first reason is, most of the time, somebody with a gun stops it before it becomes a mass shooting. And the second reason is, Mass shootings don't occur where people have guns. They occur in these things called gun-free zones. Now consider the, consider the irony. People that illegally get guns and use them to illegally kill people go places where it's illegal to have guns. Are we seeing a pattern? When you have gun-free zones, you're not eliminating a threat. You're actually escalating the threat. The people that the gun-free zone applies to are the law-abiding. These are the people that do not intend to go out and commit a crime. As a society, we have to sit down. We have to consider, we have to consider how our society perceives gun-free zones. And we have to look at how does this work? How does this actually, what results does this have? And I'm going to leave it at that. I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. We're going to hit what's left of the news segment. And then I'm going to come back. I want to talk about the Star Wars movie. That's right. I want to talk about a movie that's not out yet. It'll be out before I record the next episode. I want to talk about it because it's important that we cover it. With that said, here's how you get in touch with me. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Now we've got two categories that we're going to use today. 
And the first category we're using is law enforcement and defensive use. Now the city of San Antonio will begin to deploy a gunshot detection system in order to fight crime. These systems, I'm not too sure how well they work. I hear good things about them here. I hear bad things about them there. We'll see. Hopefully this will allow this, uh, law enforcement in San Antonio to, quick, to have a quicker response time. Moving on, let's look at politics. We got three stories there. A Rosenberg, Texas seventh grader was told that his shirt was banned because the Star Wars character displayed on it, which I believe was a stormtrooper, had a fantasy gun used in the film Star Wars The Force Awakens. People, are we so afraid of guns in school that even an image of, an, of a fan, fantasy weapon in a fantasy show or movie is considered to be grounds to punish a child? The biggest movie of the year. It hasn't even been released yet. And everybody's talking about how big of a blockbuster it's going to be. When you look at Hollywood and their obsession with pre-sold movies, which is why they're going back and redoing all these old TV shows and movies as a movie, or as new movies, they're looking for those pre-sold movies. And when they... And you got the biggest pre-sold movie probably ever, and you're going to ban a kid for wearing merchandise based off that movie? Or are you going to punish him? I don't know about you, but to me... This is wrong. This is political correctness out of control. Now, the Van Zant County Courthouse will reportedly be posted with a 30-06 and a 30-07 sign. The posting of this facility is likely to bring complaints to the ter- Texas Attorney General's office, and we'll see how well that goes for them, because apparently this is a multi-use facility. It's not just courts and court offices. Now, Van Zant County is located east of Dallas on I-20. And our final political issue... Some restaurants in Odessa, Texas, plan to ban open carry for various reasons. Now, the reason I use this article is, as a license holder, or as license holders, we should work to politely convince these businesses to change their policies. We don't go in, we don't stomp, we don't pitch a fit, we don't tell them, My rights! Because the Constitution says, and Second Amendment shall not be infringed. No, we don't go there, we don't act like uh, redneck hicks. We use logic, and we use reason. And until they take it down, every time you eat somewhere else in their city, you take that receipt, you put it in a folder, you gather all these receipts up, say, at the end of the week or the end of the month, or an env- you put it in a folder or an envelope, and then you stuff them into an envelope with a letter saying, this is the business that you lost because... You don't want me in there because I'm a member of the most law-abiding segment of the Texas population out there, and your 30-06 and 30-07 signs are offensive to me because you don't want my kind in there. And this is the money you lost because you are a, uh, you, (laughs) this is the money you lost because you are posting these signs. And you leave it at that. Every week, every month, you do this. You let them know they're losing this money. If you have friends that eat at the same restaurant, ask them to give you their receipt too if they go somewhere else, especially if they got a license. Let them see how much money they're losing. Now, with that said, I want to wrap the show up, and after the music, I'll come back. I'll give you, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about the Star Wars movie coming out, but not about Star Wars itself. I'm going to talk about going to the theater. With that said, stay safe and carry (laughs) responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Okay, we're back, and this is the after show rant. I guess you could call it that. Basically, as I was saying earlier in the episode, the Star Wars or movie that's coming out, which is Star Wars The Force Awakens, looks like it's going to be the biggest pre sold movie in history up until the next Star Wars movie comes out. And the truth of the matter is, it's going to draw a lot of publicity. There's going to be a lot of crowds, and I hope to God that the movie theaters listen to reason they use reason and that they take steps to secure their facilities and there's two types of people i see trying to make an attack on these theaters 
One are these little basement dwelling, uh, living with their parents as 24 year olds that never have seen reality outside of a video game console who want to be the, who want to be famous. So they're, they're going to try and eclipse the Batman shooter by being the star Wars shooter. I hope like hell that all the movie theaters take steps to protect themselves and their audiences from people like this. And at the same time, I hope like hell, no, I pray to God and I hope beyond hope that there are no terrorist attacks on this movie, on these movies when this happens. With that said, if you're going to the theater, keep in mind, reasonable security precautions will be no costumes, or at least no mask as part of the costume. They'll probably have no toys that look or no replicas or props or toys that look like weapons. They'll probably, uh, they'll probably have no gun signs posted all over the place. Now, some of these are reasonable. Some of them are not, or the last one's not. And I hope that these theaters actually have armed security guards inside and outside the facilities. I hope they have armed guards by the emergency exits because this is going to be a great soft target. It'll make the news. And these people that attack soft targets, they will go for these things. If you go to Star Wars opening night or even opening week, keep your head on a swivel, stay safe, and carry responsibly. If they don't want you carrying a gun and they legally uh, prohibit you from doing so, don't go. However, I fear we're going to hear about an attack just because this is too, this is too inviting of a target. As far as targets go... This is too inviting of a target to pass up for the, for anybody that wants to make the evening news nationwide, coast to coast, from Mexico to Canada. In fact, it won't even stop there. It'll go global within hours. And it's the uh, it's people like this that we have to guard against. We have to sit down. We have to think about these attacks, and we have to we really have to anticipate them and act against them. I guarantee you, every movie theater in the United States had better have thought of this uh, scenario because I promise you the law enforcement in those towns, in those cities, they have. Any law enforcement agency worth its salt that has a movie theater that's going to show Star Wars on opening day or opening week has seriously considered what it will take to defend the people going to that theater. And hopefully those movie theaters have done the same. Otherwise, well, otherwise... They're serving up their their customers on a silver platter to any would-be terrorist, any would-be little basement dwelling. I'm trying not to use the foul language. Any basement dwelling uh, reality or inexperienced with reality uh, shithead. That's the word we can use. That's a word or a term we can use that wants to try and make a name for themselves. And you have to understand. There are plenty of sick people out there, and only the sick people go out there and they do these things. Some of you may be saying, Aaron, you're you're going out, you're almost like you're promising this is going to happen. No, I am sitting down, I am looking at a pattern, and I fear that somebody's going to do this. Not because I have anything concrete, but because a human mind is good at recognizing patterns. Now imagine, you got this kid, every time he dies on his Xbox or his PlayStation, just simply starts over at a save point. He's never really seen the real world between his Xbox and the school. Uh, you know what I mean? Outside of that, he's never seen the real world. His babysitter has been cartoons and the game console. His reality changes with the change of a game disc. The true real world reality escapes him. He knows he wants to be famous. And in the games, nobody ever really dies. So he's he's kind of had his brain rewired so that death really doesn't have any meaning to him. Killing people that may or may not have a meaning to him. It may have a meaning that it's a score. It may have a meaning that he's actually keeping people from seeing others. And it may not. He may just be out there earning achievements in his mind. Or you may have a terrorist. And you have multiple cells across the country hitting multiple theaters. And you can't tell me a major blockbuster movie is not going to be an attractive target to instill terror. Star Wars. The the entire franchise of Star Wars. 
represents America to a degree. It's an American concept. It's an American production. And it makes a lot of American money. And it's owned by the one company that screams America more than any other company on a global scale. It's owned by Disney. So when you attack Star Wars, you're attacking America. Or at least that's what the Durka Durka douchebags will think if they try to do it. And I pray to God that this does not happen. I hope beyond hope that it doesn't happen. I pray that our law enforcement and our various uh, theaters, as well as the people going, are prepared to fight off any attacks that they face when they go to this movie. And there are those who will say, oh, nothing will happen, nothing will happen. And I hope they're right. But because I am an individual, and I am the first responder to anything I am involved in, I have to be prepared for something like this. How do you prepare for something like this? Do you not go? That's a possibility. Do you only go to a theater where you can carry concealed and you sit where you can make your way to an escape uh, very easily? These are all personal decisions that you have to base on your situation. With that said, and especially if you go to the Star Wars movie in the first day or the first week it's released. So if you do go, this applies especially to you. If you don't go, it still applies especially when I say it this time, stay safe and carry responsibly.